I'm very happy today to introduce Ulrich Dangle. He was an exchange student in the MARC program in Eugene. He came from the University of Stuttgart, one of the top schools in Germany, and he helped me teach computer graphics. So Ulrich finished his diploma at the University of Stuttgart, where he worked on a deployable medical hospital with Werner Sobeck of the Institute of Lightweight Structures. He then went on to work at Foster's Associates, working on projects such as the Frankfurt Airport Extension and the McLaurin Mercedes R&D Center for Formula One race cars. Um, prior to teaching, he also worked at Nicholas Grimshaw's office, working on the extension of the Eden Project. Um, at University of Texas, he teaches construction, structures, building envelope, and design studio. He's an award winner of the University of Texas Teaching Awards. And today he's here to talk about his recently published book, Bau Kunz, Sustainable Architecture in Vorarlberg. Please join me in welcoming Ulrich Dangle. Thank you, Nancy. It's, uh, it's nice to be back here. I graduated in 99, and then um, my wife, which I, who I actually met at the university as well. And I, we came back in last year um, for a conference, so it's, it's always nice to be back here in Portland. Um, wh what I want to talk about today is, um, is the, the little Austrian province of Vorarlberg, which is um, um, relatively well known in Europe, but um, even, even though it's been, individual projects have been published um, in, in, in various magazines, um, there haven't been uh, very many publications, in particular English English speaking ones, that kind of give a good overview of, of, of the region's architecture. Can everyone hear me? Is this close enough? Okay. So um, what I'm what I'm talking about today is kind of in connection with um, some of my research and scholarship that I've been doing in my uh, recently published book, Sustainable Architecture in Vorarlberg. And I have it up here um, for anyone who wants to take a look at it. Um, later on. Um, I can shamelessly promote it because I don't get a dime of, <laughs> of any of the sales. It's, if, if you're first author, you, you're pretty much happy if you don't have to uh, pay them any money to publish it. Um, but it was published by Birkhäuser Basel in, in Switzerland in, in both the German and in English language um, edition. So I, I want to talk to you a little bit about the, the region. Um, it's kind of eco-sex eco, socioeconomic, socioeconomic background and kind of the, the, the tradition of craft in the region. And then I'm going to um, and show you some of the vernacular examples and then um, show you kind of four projects a little bit more in detail, um, recently completed projects um, that are also featured, featured in my book. Um, Vorarlberg itself, itself is located on the northwestern slopes of the Austrian Alps and it borders the countries of um, Germany, Switzerland, and Liechtenstein. It's the smallest Austrian, it's the second smallest Austrian province after Vienna, but it's also the most, second most densely populated. It, it's got a population about, of about 370,000 um, people, so it's hardly even, even the size of a medium-sized European city. Um, it inhabits an area of about 1,000 square miles. The region is um, geographically closed off from the rest of Austria, and the only connections to the neighboring province of Tyrol to the, to the east are, is, are provided by three surface roads as well as a railroad and street tunnel through the Alberg Mountain. Um, due to that isolated location, most of the population actually speaks a very distinctive German dialect that um, most, most of the other countries' inhabitants um, have a hard time to understand. It's more similar to the Alemannic dialects that are spoken in, a, in, in neighboring Switzerland, southern Germany, Liechtenstein and the Alsace region in France. And even, even many towns and villages have their own sub-dialect. So in terms of the kind of the ethnic background, it's more related to, to, to the other countries, whereas um, Austria um, and the language that's spoken there is part of the Bavarian Austrian language um, group. It's an Alp alpine region, extremely mountainous, and therefore offers relatively unfavorable conditions for, for intensive farming. It also does not possess any significant resources valuable natural resources. And for centuries, the land actually could not feed the population. And the younger generations and children were often sent abroad um, as seasonal workers to the more prosperous neighboring countries. 
The province had a relatively strong uh, agricultural tradition, but experienced an early industrialization at the beginning of the 19th century, particularly in the area of textile manufacturing, and is still relatively um, strong there. Um, the rise of the textile industry had its origins in the traditional production of linen and benefited greatly from the craftsmanship and skill set of the farming population, which in return became heavily involved in the home-based manufacturing of industrial textiles and, and other goods. Um, sorry, let me go back here one second. You can kind of faintly see that uh, the Rhine River um, is also part, I don't think this is working very well. The Rhine River, the river actually flows through um, Vorarlberg. It originates, and it's really hard to see, it originates in, originates in Switzerland, and then flows along um, the um, Austrian Swiss border, and you can kind of see where it discharges into the Lake of Constance, and then um, flows, and then basically exits the Lake of Constance um, on the western side, and then flows through Germany. Um, the Netherlands and then in the, into the North Sea. So um, with, the, with the regulation of the Rhine River, the construction of the railroad, and you can see this is a view back from the Lake of Constance, um, the, the Rhine River Valley and the Alpine peaks in the back. So with the construction of the railroad, the regulation of the river, and then the use of water power gave the province a basis for its own economic growth, and this also led to an influx of a lot of foreign labor, in particular from Italy and Turkey. Today, Vorarlberg is actually the most heavily industrialized region of Austria, but mostly small-scale family-owned businesses and produces with the lowest energy consumption in the entire country. And 97% of the province's electricity are actually um, generated through hydroelectric power. And of the 170,000 people that are employed, actually only about 3,000 still work in farming. And m most people actually work in the textile, and electrical, and machine manufacturing and construction. The per capita, per capita income of export, ex, of export goods is four times higher than the United States and, and Japan, and is only surpassed by Switzerland, actually. So due, due to it, this region's relatively compact size, it, it might really come as a surprise that a, a really con contemporary and innovative architecture was able to emerge um, over the last three decades. This is, however, deeply rooted in the region's longstanding tradition of building craft. And a number of pioneering architects have established a strong technical, cost-efficient, and functional vocabulary, vocabulary that has evolved into a unique architectural culture. Um, today, this really serves as an exclusive setting and laboratory in which architects and craftsmen search for symbi symbiotic connection between specifically regional architecture on one hand, but also a progressive architectural formal language on the other. In addition to that, they try to to try to um, accommodate the connections between technology and ecology, as well as between the housing needs of the population and the requirements of the industry. This is probably the most famous building in, in Vorarlberg in Bregenz, which is ironically not built by a Vorarlberg architect. You probably all know the Kunsthaus by Peter Zumthor, which is located right at the shores of the Lake of Constance. You can get, this is kind of looking up the, the, the hill that you see that you saw behind the, behind the Kunsthaus. Um, you can see the, you know, where the lake and the, and the mountains come, to, come together. The mountains in the distance are actually already Switzerland. Um, then, then when you turn around on this mountain, look the other direction, you see kind of the, the, the foothills of the, Alpine, of the Alpine peaks, just to kind of give you, give you an idea of the, of the topography and uh, of, the, of, the, of the setting. And the, the, the region is, I mean, if you also look back at, oops, sorry look back at the Rhine River Valley, the, the region is relatively sprawled out. It's mostly small, independent cities uh, or towns um, with a lot of autonomy. Um, sprawl, and sprawling and kind of the urban planning aspect of the region are kind of the, 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 new, the new crisis that they've kind of identified. But nevertheless, um, architects you know, all work together with the, with the community and the, and the local planning authorities to, um, to start doing something about that. Um, carpentry is one of the oldest and most important building trades, also in, in, in Vorarlberg, and really formed the foundation of its architectural culture. The trade was organized in so-called guilds, which regulated, regulated the profession, uh, determined the rules of conduct, and they were not only professional organizations, but were also associations in the honor of God. Um, and you even, even, even today, I mean, even today, you can still de still see carpenter um, apprentices wandering the wandering the the the, the roads. Um, the the final practical exam for these um, for these apprentices consisted of either a building or a model, the so-called journeyman's piece. And this was followed by a three-year journey, 
which apprentice then should use to get to know other parts of the world and new working methods. And the rules were relatively strict. The journeymen were not able to come home during that three-year period, nor were they able to um, work at the same construction site for more than six months. And here, here's a kind of a picture of uh, the, the, the gentleman on the right is kind of the attire that you sometimes still see, the, 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 the gilded attire, the black corduroy vests and bell-bottom pants as well as their wide-brimmed head. I mean, it's kind of a, a dying breed, but you can still see them um, in, 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 in Vorarlberg and as well as other parts of you know, southern, southern Germany. <clears throat> the guilds were actually um, able to exploit the building boom after the destructions of the Thirty Years' War, which lasted from 1616 to 1648. And a lot of the guilds were um, responsible for um, many of the magnificent architectural pieces um, in, in southern Germany, Switzerland, Alsace, and Bohemia. So between 1615 and 1800, a lot of craftsmen from Vorarlberg constructed all these buildings in the neighboring countries. And some of the villages actually report that during this, the building season between March and October, up to 90% of the male population were uh, away and working away from home. So for, there, were, there were several of Vorarlberg Baroque, Baroque, Baroque masters, um, master builders that emerged out of these and they designed many churches and monasteries. Some of the best examples can be found, uh, for example, in St. Gallen in, in Switzerland, built by Peter Thun. Um, up to the 19th century, the craftsmen were not only, um, the carpenters were not only craftsmen, but they were also um, architects and engineers. The, with the industrialization, that brought some new tasks. However, the, 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 the carpenters' responsibilities diminished significantly. However, the, the tools of the trade remained relatively unchanged all the way to the, uh, from the Middle Ages, actually all the way to the 20th century when the manual labor was increasingly replaced um, by power tools and the use of machinery. Timber kind of forms an important resource of Vorarlberg's for architectural culture and one third of the, 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 the province is actually still covered with forest. And, and as early as the Middle Ages, these forests or mountainous areas were um, identified to fulfill important protective functions. Um, they obviously served as effective measures against avalanches and landslides. And today's pollution and acid rain and forest diebreak are, are obviously a global program, but they proved especially disastrous to some of these communities that kind of lose their um, protective devices from some of these natural disasters. And in the past, logging, wa logging the timber was also the carpenter's craftsman's responsibility, so they would actually um, go into the forest to select the woods, healthy and straight trees for construction, um, cut them down, would then um, from them, shape them into um, beams and boards for construction with their broad axes. And, but then towards the, towards the end of the, of the 19th century, sawmills became, uh, started to flourish and they kind of put, a put an end to that close relationship that the carpenters had established with the material as a result of that manual processing. So the timber, timber for construction was now cost effectively um, um, cut by the mills and readily available for purchase. Um, there were certain areas in the, in the province that still retained their manual techniques all the way into the 1950s. Um, so the, 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 the region is not only densely wooded, but also possesses numerous creeks and rivers, rivers which facilitated the installation of these uh, water-powered sawmills. And um, up to the 19th century, Almost every village had its own sawmill, or they shared facility. Many farmers shared communal facilities. But then, with, with the improvement of the infrastructure and the rise of the larger mills, a lot of these smaller ones um, couldn't compete and um, um, weren't able to survive. Um, then, in the early 20th century, um, new manufacturing techniques, for example, the, the production of glue lamb beams and concrete formwork, formwork, opened up new opportunities for the sawmills and the carpentry businesses throughout throughout Vorarlberg. Um, timber has excellent insulating properties and makes it the obvious building material material of choice in the cold climate of the Alps, Alps especially uh, with its abundance there and is uh, much preferred over, over masonry construction. And uh, through that abundance of timber, the, the tradition of craft and carpentry in Vorarlberg was able to evolve. Um, if, if allowed to to dry properly, timber-framed houses are extremely durable and can withstand even the harsh conditions found in the mountains. This all goes back to, to careful detailing and assembly techniques to successfully protect untreated wooden part, building parts such as vertical facades, windows and doors from rain, wind and snow. 
over time, the, the sun will uh, burn the, 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 the sun-facing facades a dark brown color, while the shaded sides of a building will, will get washed out and turn a, turn a silvery gray as they age. And some of the su most successful examples, this is actually dates back to 1629, mid-17th century, mid century. So um, talking about sustainability, a building with a lifespan of over 300 years is, is, is kind of a good start. Um, before fossil fuels were available, timber was the sole energy source, in addition to serving as a dominant construction material for the manufacturing of everyday goods. And extensive logging created a shortage early on in, in not just this region, but in everywhere throughout um, um, Europe, which led to the creation of strict laws regarding the, 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 the cutting of timber and its use. It's, it's therefore actually no surprise that the origins of the word sustainability can be found in 18th century European forestry regulations. And, and the, first, the first document that actually mentions um, the word sustainability is um, the 1713 publication of um, the, the German administrator Karl von Karlowitz um, titled Silvicultura Economica, which is the first comprehensive treaty, treatise on forestry. And it uses the term, the German term nachhaltend, which means sustainable, um, to formulate the concept of a sustainability in forestry for the very first time. And this idea of sustainability caught on in Europe throughout the 18th century. Vast areas were reforested, measured and divided. Soils were evaluated. Plants and animals were classified. And the deforestation was, was more or less reversed. Forest academies were founded in Germany, England, uh, France. And the term was eventually translated into other languages, the term Nachhaltigkeit, and resulting in the 19th century English term sustained yield forestry, which would then, ser which would then um, serve as a source for the the, the, the modern word sustainability. Um, nevertheless, the timber remained the, the most important, the cheapest building uh, material for the vernacular architecture in Fallberg. So everything in and around the house was made of timber. The furniture, the paling, paneling of the parlor, the roof covering, uh, with the, 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 sh the shingle layers on the, on the facades, um, the firewood used for, for, for heating, even some of the, most of the farming tools and some of the everyday footwear. Um, so initially, what started out as relatively primitive um, shelters, um, these buildings were then subdivided and added to, and, and through this, the different, various different farmhouse types in Foralberg were able to develop. Um, <clears throat> they, um, they, were not the, they were not the end result of a close development cycle, but con constantly changed and adapted to changing um, economical and, and demographic conditions. Um, for example, after the Thirty Years' War, the increase of pop prosperity and population meant that the buildings, the houses were larger and more magnificent. Then again, when intensive farming practices were introduced in the 19th century, it forced the farmers to increase their livestock, to increase um, stables and have more storage space for feed. So these houses um, constantly in, in evolved throughout the centuries. Um, there, there are kind of two main construction techniques that were used in the region. The one is called the the so-called Ständerbohlenbau, which is a pretty much a post and beam construction method. Um, and there's very few examples that have um, survived over time. One of the greatest, great examples here, the, the, this building in Sulz dating from the 16th century. And it's basically based on, based, derived from a construction technique where vertical posts are simply driven into the ground and then later techniques rested on a stone plane to keep the wood away from moisture. moisture. And so these posts were driven in the ground, and posts and beams, horizontal beams, make up the, the framework. And then in between, everything is filled in with 8 to 12 centimeter wide um, boards that are more just slotted into, into that uh, primary structure. And it's, it's, it's a construction technique that doesn't use very much, very much wood um, compared to, to, the, to the more popular um, law construction technique, which I'm gonna, I'm gonna show in a second. So in most, in most cases, this technique was only used for outbuildings, barns, and, and stables. The, the most common technique is the law construction, the so-called block bow, which um, you know, you're all familiar with. It's, 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 it's a technique where timber members are stacked horizontally and linked in the corners using cock joints. And then hardwood packs were inserted um, to interlock the individual courses, creating a structure of, of, of great rigidity. So you can see uh, some of the detailing where an interior wall meets the, meets the external facade. You can see the end pieces of that, the, the end cuts of the wood there. Um, with increased industrialization, these, these um, the mass-produced, uh, cheaply mass-produced 
metal nails became widely available and um, the farmers started to clad their buildings since obviously what you're looking at with the law construction is this, uh, the structural elements um, of, the, of, of the buildings. They started to clad their, their buildings in, in a shingle-like, a scale-like shingle skin which effectively protected um, the, the, the structural members behind it from rain. And this, this obviously, this skin had a lifespan of, you know, maybe 20, 20, 30 years, depending on and a lot of times even less. And it was something that could easily be changed um, throughout time and, and updated. And, um, I mean, you can see, um, this is kind of an interesting example where you can see the pent roofs that's, you can see the line where the, where the shingles get lighter is, the, is where the where a little roof overhang comes out to protect the windows below. And you can see that the vertical surfaces are burned dark brown by the sun. And then you can see where the, most of the water runs off of these pent roofs. They're, they're, the, the, the pigment is washed out and they've turned that, that silvery gray. Here's kind of a, a good juxtaposition of that condition. So you get that combination of the, of the burned, burned brown with a washed out silvery gray and then in addition kind of parts that have been have been recently replaced by new shingles. And this material was used for, um, was used in vertical applications, but also for, for roof surfaces. And it's still used in, in, in the remodel of, of historic buildings. But then it's also a language that a lot of the contemporary architects have adapted for their, um, for kind of the new contemporary architectural style, as you can see here in this, in this community center. Um, and, you know, integrated um, very nicely with the, with the contemporary language of its architecture. Um, when thinking of traditional European um, timber framed houses, you, a lot of times you think of this type of timber frame construction, which is, um, which is mostly, uh, mostly, it was mostly developed in regions that um, were rich in deciduous trees, since these produce relatively short um, structural members. Um, but since Vorarlberg had a, had had an abundance of coniferous trees, just like Scandinavia does, or the Rocky Mountains, for example. It was um, it was pretty easy to um, use a construction technique um, like the log construction technique, where it's really where you're looking at large, long structural members um, that then form develop, form a kind of a massive type of construction. So Forlberg has a few of these examples, but and and is one of has some of the best preserved examples in Austria, but really only because it's at that intersection of these different countries and different construction styles. So most of the most of the timber construction you'll find in Austria is not going to be this type of timber framed, half timbered construction. Um, the Forlberg's timber construction was put to the test with the rise of the bourgeois class in the um, late late 19th, early into early 20th century, since new values were established. Suddenly, timber houses um, conveyed uh, an image of poverty and being old-fashioned, uh, since they were considered a sign of belonging to the working class. In addition, it also became popular belief that timber was an ephemeral but imperishable material, and even though thousands of these old timber buildings proved otherwise. Masonry homes were actually the status of the new upper coming middle and upper classes and became the prevalent timbing t um, building type. As a result, many of the timber houses were actually, after the fact, stuccoed uh, to make them look like they're more expensive masonry neighbors. I particularly like this um, very careful addition that was done here with uh, masonry to this farmhouse. Timber construction experienced a revival in the 1960s when a group of young architects started practicing in Vorarlberg. Hans Purin, Rudolf Weger, Jakob Albrecht, Günther Ratzfeld, and Leopold Kaufmann they designed timber houses which, through their lack of traditional elements, such as roof overhangs in combination with open floor plans, flat roofs, unusually large windows, received a lot of criticism among the population. Leopold um, Kaufmann um, remarks, and I quote, my first projects in the 60s had neither the proper roof, nor the proper form, nor the right windows. The result was that my neighbors no longer greeted me after attending Sunday Mass. So you can see there, um, with their designs, they formulated alternatives to the prevalent local provincialism, which was more or less based and misguided by formal interpretations of the historic uh, building stock. And the, the architects really they established a dialogue with the region's rich timber building tradition, the craft, the carpentry trade, and used, used the carpentry trade's craftsmanship skills as a basis for their own new timber frame con construction systems. Another problem that came up is Forelberg is uh, traditionally kind of a single family house um, uh, society, more or less. Um, with, with a single family home being the prevalent building type, uh, the strong desire of home ownership 
contributed to urban sprawl and put the homeowners under enormous financial pressure. So an important question arose among the architects, who are we building for if most people can't actually afford their own house? One of the members of the group, Hans Purin, one, um, who was one of the pioneers, offered a solution uh, with, a, with this housing estate designed in 1964. Uh, this is the second phase, 1967, which is still considered one of the best um, um, multifamily housing examples in Austria, where a, a framework of massive dividing masonry walls was provided, which could then be filled in by the future residents using a system of, tim of lightweight timber frame floors and walls. And this, is, this is the project today. The owners completed about 20% of the construction themselves, and through this, the project served as an excellent example for simple, cost-efficient, and collaborative building. This same technique was used in 1979 by the Cooperative, which is a group, was a group of young architects that consisted of Dietmar Eberle, who you might know from Baumschlager Eberle, and Wolfgang Ewen, Markus Koch, and Norbert Mittersteiner. And they also cooperated with their clients, to, and they were looking at alternative ways of living and building together. Timber was the material of choice because it was easy to process without the need for heavy machinery and skilled workers and also allowed for simple structural systems and a large amount of flexibility. So while professional carpenters erected the primary timber freight structures, floors, walls, glazing, winter gardens, and the cladding were completed by the young architects and, and the future residents. This made the project financially viable for everyone involved and resulted in communal living spaces that were unprecedented on the housing market at that time. Um, however, those t new timber houses, and this is a, a shot that I took a few years ago of, the, of that same uh, development, those houses were despairingly called chicken coop or barns since their appearance contradicted with the popular expectations of a privately owned home made out of masonry or stone. And however, um, the experience that the architects gained in these low-cost projects allowed them to develop professional logistic skills that addressed all aspects of the building process. Um, and the, the quality of the built environment reached a new level and, and increasingly impressed and convinced the local building authorities, cooperatives, and construction companies. And the, the, the resulting simplicity, rationality, and minimal aesthetic were not a product of theoretically applied ideas, but they were an outcome of a profession aspiring to make a step-by-step -step transition from traditional craftsmanship skills to customized industrial fabrication. And straightforward, straight modern, construct, straightforward mod, modern construction techniques were used with the goal of minimizing the use of material while generating a maximum amount of enclosed space. So, so Forelberg's architecture, as you can see, is, is, is a result of this regional development that is more or less unprecedented in the world. Um, and as a continuation of what started in the 1960s 60s with the first pioneers, the, the, the contemporary architects today have worked systematically over the last um, several decades to establish an expertise in technology, cost efficiency, and, and, and functionality. And um, th their work is not, not necessarily based on formal aspects, but primarily focuses on influences from today's construction industry and manufacturing technology. And the, ground, the concepts are grounded in structural efficiency, maximum use of minimal resources, usability in the client's needs, and which results in simple yet very um, functional spaces. And this, this sophisticated simplicity, as I would call it, it should not mis be misconstrued as being plain or basic. As it's, and I think it's best described using um, German architect Heinrich Tessenhoff's words. And he states, the simplest form is not always the best, but the best is always simple. So through, through predominantly building with Timper, the architects developed the rigor and expertise as part of their design process, which then also proved to be useful when building with other materials and construction techniques. And the initial members of this movement, like I said earlier, were fundamentally opposed to a formal regionalism that was based on, on misunderstood tradition. Their intention, intention was not to replicate traditional forms as it had happened so often in some of the ski resorts, and which uh, you'll even find you know, here in, in, in the United States, kind of the alpine kitsch. Um, but their goal was to translate and update traditional processes and principles as they related to the construction and the, the manufacturing of these houses. Um, the architecture is unique in the fact that it takes up extremely um, modern tendencies, such as the promotion of modular living accommodation or the, the use of latest industrial building components. However, without ignoring uh, and abandoning traditional construction skills and housing typologies of the, reason, of the region, and, and, and new and old can harmoniously kind of exist um, next to each other. And I mean, you, if you look at this picture, which is obviously a picture that was taken right after this uh, residence here was completed, 
Um, and that's a problem with some of the glossy magazine pictures that you see is the wood's brand new, but you give it a few years and this building will look like it's its, it's neighbor that's several hundred years old. So um, here's kind of a better example. The, 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 the contemporary architecture, um, even though it might not completely blend in with the traditional architecture in its form, um, start to blend in in terms of its material use. Um, and, and this development was not the product of the architects alone. It was a combination of enlightened clients, climate for open discussion and cooperation of the authorities, and a broad consensus on the aesthetic qualities and energy consumption. And all these contributed to the appreciation and promotion of these contemporary and sustainable architectural principles. Um, the traditional carpentry trade has successfully made the transition to modern fabrication techniques and plays an active and very important role in the planning and design process to setting extremely high um, craftsmanship standards. Um, but this, this prefabrication plays an important role, but it's not rooted in, in, in cheap and industrial mass production, but in carefully crafted customization by the carpentry trade, as it has been done for centuries, actually. Many, many architecture, many fan manufacturers actually offer their, they offer their own prefabricated kit houses, which have been developed in, in, in collaboration with, with, with architects. And they're thus kind of competing with, you know, many of the Scandinavian house builders and so forth. I want to show you um, uh, three, three projects real quickly, kind of examples, um, different, different typologies, and we can talk about them in a little bit more detail. Um, the first one is this uh, single family residence, which is still a housing um, typology that's very important in the region. Um, and it's, um, it, this was actually a result of a close collaboration between the architect and the client who actually owns a mill working company right next door. Um, the, the house um, is, is laid out on three levels. Um, you have entrance, garage, laundry, and storage spaces on the ground floor. Then you can see the, with vast amounts of glazing, you can see the, the, the living and kitchen area on the upper level. And then um, on the top level, more secluded, are the, are the bedrooms and, 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 and bathroom quarters to keep them private and secluded. Um, and the, the building's simple volume with a gabled roof, with a covered patio, which is a traditional element in, in the construction there, in the vernacular architecture. And the wood cladding reflects the traditional building elements, which can be found throughout the region, but at the same time, its, its construction principles uh, present an unconventional depart, departure from traditional timber-framed houses. The, 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 the building rests on a concrete, uh, fair-face concrete plinth, and the wall ceilings and roofs of the upper levels are made of prefabricated solid, solid timber panels. You can kind of see a section there. You can kind of see that the lower part is made up the, out of concrete and the part that's kind of embedded in the ground. But the, the, up, the upper stories are made of um, panel solid wood panels that consist of 11 layers of spruce and fir boards, which add up to an overall thickness of about a foot, about 30 centimeters. And, and this innovative construction system solely relies on, on wood dowels to hold the individual boards together and does not use any glue, solvents, or, or metal fasteners. All building materials for the assembly are environmentally friendly and can be fully recycled. So all, all wood walls, ceilings, and roofs are made of these single-leaf solid timber panels, which are not only load-bearing, but also fulfill several other, several other performance requirements regards, with regards to moisture release and so forth. And, and due to the choice of construction method, though, the, you had to um, do the planning of all the, and routing of all plumbing and electrical, electrical systems um, beforehand, um, because obviously every single switch and, and electrical outlet had to be located during the planning phase since every wall and ceiling first surface was either made of a fair face concrete wall or a prefabricated timber, timber panel. So it's a solid form of construction. And th this required a lot of upfront coordination um, by the consultants on one hand. On the other hand, it made the actual construction phase a lot faster and efficient because all these issues had already been resolved previously in the planning phase. The, the panels, the panels are in addition, uh, are clad with um, with untreated oak oak boards on the outside, which are sanded smooth and installed without any visible joints. And you can see, you can start to see it here that over time the facades will kind of turn, weather turn kind of the soft um, gray color, and which will which will blend in well, first of all, with a concrete base as well as um, all the other surrounding vernacular buildings. Um, the interior finishes are, are limited to concrete and wood surfaces, which are merely oiled and free of any harmful lacquers and solvents. 
And um, um, the residence is actually heated by a wood chip heating system, which is located in the adjacent uh, wood shop, mill workshop, so they can take advantage of a biomass heating system, um, making it a, a carbon neutral heating, heating solution. And um, the, the, the wood panels are also very good because they're able to store large amounts of heating energy during the day, which are then, they're then able to release back slowly to the interior throughout the day and night. And this, this thermal storage capacity prevents the home from overheating in the summertime as would, you know, a lot of times occur with common just timber framed houses. So the, the timber fan panel system offers the advantage of reduced on-site construction time, excellent fire rating, improved acoustics, and also improved air door quality through avoidance of any toxic glues and solvents. Um, it all, they also um, absorb and release moisture as needed and, and aid in regulating the interior climate. And another, another nice side effect, maybe not for everyone home, ho not maybe for everyone, every homeowner, but are the, that they actually block almost 100% of any harmful electromagnetic radiation such as wireless phone, phone signals. So all these aspects um, contribute to the creation of a, of a, of a comfortable and, and, and very healthy home. The next project I want to show you is a, is a school building, which is actually made entirely out of um, fair-faced con concrete. But for the ones of you that have ever worked with fair-faced concrete, you, um, I mean, you, you wonder how this building relates to the traditional, to the craft tradition in the region. Um, but for the ones of you that have actually worked with fair-faced concrete, the concrete finish is only as good as the formwork. And the formwork historically has been done by carpenters. So um, the region is fortunate enough to have very skilled carpenters, which uh, produce exceptional exceptional formwork for, for some of these fair face concrete applications. Um, so th this, this, this design was a kind of a very challenging project for the architects um, because it, uh, it was a very compact site and um, very lo located and close to the existing church, or the community center and the school, and, and, and was, uh, part of it was also a small kind of urban community planning exercise to restore kind of the center of the, of, of the community itself. Um, each, each individual story actually frames a different view of the landscape and this, this, through this um, kind of appealing spatial relationships are created on the inside of the, of the volume. So you have large south-facing south, south windows in the classrooms that allow views of the alpine mountain ranges in the distance and, um, and then you have um, other levels that orient themselves towards the, 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 the square below as well as the, the church. Um, up on the, uh, on the higher level. So um, according to the architect Markus, Markus Kukovic, um, he stated that pastor, mayor, and teachers still command, respect, and hold positions of power in, in this part of the world. And he stated that the, with the design of this new elementary school, they picked up on this old tradition that the buildings for these three pillars of society in this rural region are built out of solid materials. So reinforced concrete is actually only used where it has a structural application, and it can be experienced on the building's facade and the inside and becomes a part of the building's spatial experience. The inside, the, these cold and hard surfaces uh, of the concrete are then, and the load-bearing structure are then complemented on the inside by the use of wood for all non-load-bearing building components. All wall, floor, and ceiling finishes, as well as the built-in furnishings, are made of native silver fir and reference the local material and building craft tradition. Um, for the first time, actually, in an Austrian school, the architects were able to convince the regulating authorities to approve the use of untreated interior wood surfaces. The walls are actually just plain smoothly and the floors are just fine sawn. And this is actually goes back to a tradition where untreated silver floors can be found throughout the region in some of the Baroque churches um, that have obviously endured over centuries. Um, so the, 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 the minimized formal language and this reduced material palette identify the, 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 the five-story building definitely as a contemporary building. And uh, the architecture is relatively unapologetic and purposely denies any traditional references. And instead of evoking any typical childhood connotations, which you might expect in, a, in an elementary school of an, in a school of a, in the design of an elementary school, the architect actually focused on a clear formal language and the use of well-crafted and, and carefully detailed materials. And the, the use of materials actually allows the students to not only experience their school visually, but also enable them to enjoy their other senses. So the classroom and hallways actually give off a, a pleasant smell through the, un, 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 through the unsealed wood floors and walls and to, you know, to ability, the ability to touch different kind of surface finishes enriches the interaction with the, with the building. This building is also power, powered with a, by a biomass powered heating plant which is located underneath the, the plaza that it's facing. 
And which in addition supplies several neighboring buildings in the village with heating energy and is less able to reduce the CO2 emissions through the combustion of wood pellets. Also, the mechanical ventilation system uh, replaces the prevalent practice of natural ventilation in, in, in the school buildings and prevents excessive energy losses through improper window operation by the building users, which is actually a trend um, in, in, in all of, in all of um, you know, Germany, Switzerland, and, and Austria to, to actually have residences mechanically ventilated kind of according to the passive house uh, strategy so to avoid any of the um, energy losses that occur through natural ventilation. Um, this is this is kind of the classroom view. I mean, I don't know how you would ever be able to sit through a, a class without any distractions, but it's 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 a beautiful building. Um, let me move on because I'm running out of time here. Um, I just want to show you uh, another another building concept, which is actually the first uh, building in Austria, first, first multifamily residential building to be built according to the Austrian passive energy house standards which is obviously a passive a standard that was developed for single family residences but this 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 building is trying this this project is it's it's a pilot project is trying to to make living in in kind of multifamily residences kind of an, an attractive alternative to the to the typical single family house and obviously also comes along with with cost savings um, the, the, this low energy housing development serves as a, as a pilot project and attempts to translate all these families of a single family house into a multifamily residential project. So one of the key aspects was to offer modular architecture which a maxim, with a maximum amount of flexibility, which would allow future owners to customize their floor plans according to individual lead, needs. So not only being sustainable in terms of building green with green materials, but also being sustainable in terms of, you know, if you have a family lab that lives here, they raise their kids in a 200, a 2,000 square foot apartment. What happens after the kids move move out? How can, you know, how can two people um, use this space, um, make make useful uh, useful use of that space without um, being being wasteful? Um, so, uh, so as important as the initial customization of the for for the individual floor plans was the ability to to later to make changes by removing interior walls. And, and, and each unit, as I said, should be able to grow old with its owner by adapting to these changing user requirements over time. And, and, and even though this framework allows for a very high degree of flexibility of the, in, for the, of the individual units, the overall exterior, it was important to keep the overall exterior experience consistent and, and unaffected by these interior changes, which you could imagine could be kind of a messy undertaking if people can tear out walls and do whatever they want. Um, so while the windows and doors can be arranged according to individual preferences, the continuing terraces that actually line the, the, the building, building's perimeter, as well as the movable perforated uh, metal shutters compensate for any of these irregularities that happen in the elevations. And the structure is a, is a reinforced concrete frame to get the, get the clear spans and then um, all, no all non-load bearing exterior and interior walls as well as the privacy screens between the apartments are made of prefabricated timber panels. Um, relatively deep floor buildups accommodate, accommodate building services and facilitate flexibility because you obviously want to keep all these services out of the walls. It ha that each unit has an underflow heating system which is contained in that slab buildup. Um, and there's an, optional, there's an option to add um, um, mechanical ventilation to the individual units which can be suspended with higher ceiling heights of up to um, 10 feet can accommodate um, any potential ductwork. Um, so, so, in, so, so in, in combination with the outdoor terraces, these the, these perforated shutters uh, allow the creation of individualized outdoor um, living spaces and the opportunities to retreat without changing the building's overall um, appearance. And um, um, you can see that. Um, move on. Um, you can see they're, they're relatively simple spaces. Um, also, the, the building is run by a central wood pellet heating system, which um, again is a CO2 neutral um, heating solution. The owners were able to select the mechanical ventilation system with heat recovery as an optional upgrade, but that was um, optional at the time of purchase. So actually only one of the buildings right now is built according to Vorarlberg's passive house standard with that according heating demand. And, and this project sir, will be monitored over the next several years um, as, as an outcome of this extensive research study and so that um, 
the data and knowledge of its performance can be used for further, um, further uh, new developments later down the line. The last project I want to, um, there's just a few more interior shots, sorry. Um, the last project I want to end on is this uh, little community center in a, in, a, in a community of about 900 inhabitants. And um, the community was seeking to unite all its necessary municipal services under one roof. And uh, the architect, Johannes Kaufmann's competition-winning design for this community center proposed a single-story building, which is facing the village's main square on the one side, but then rises to a three-story volume towards the north by taking advantage of the site's topography. So the building, again, is able to complement the overall ensemble of church, school, and, and the local inn, but at the same time preserves the spectacular panoramic views from the village square. Um, as a result, uh, important visual relationships between the existing buildings can be maintained and the, the historic fabric of the, of the village remains in, intact. You can see that level change, how the building is able ri to rise to a three-story volume on the north-facing side. The client wanted to use locally grown and harvested spruce and fir for the construction of their new building since the community actually uses its, uh, owns its own forest and is actually one of six uh, villages which is um, part of the Großes Walzertal Biosphere Reserve. Biosphere reserves are um, sites recognized by UNESCO, which demonstrate, demonstrate innovative approaches to conservation and sustainable development. So it was very important uh, to use regionally sourced materials and to employ local businesses in order to retain added value in, in, in the region. As a, as a trained carpenter, the architect, Johannes Kaufmann, welcomed the decision to mainly use wood for the, for the community center since it, allowed him, since it allowed him to take advantage of its extensive knowledge in woodworking skills. However, using the locally harvested timber uh, meant that assembling a cutting list of sections early on to ensure that the wood could be cut and dried in time for construction was essential. So before the structural system actually had been coordinated with the engineer, the architect actually met with the mayor and the ranger in the local forest to order, in order to select trees for, for construction that they could be cut and, and, and dried. He then sat down with the carpenter and owner of the sawmill and determined 40 to 50 different cut patterns each of which identified which particular tree part of the tree would be used for what purpose. Would it be siding? Would it be um, um, structural members in the roof or in the walls and so forth? So th this, this process allowed the assignment of the specific grade of wood for each building component and also ensured that each tree trunk was used as efficiently as possibly while at the same time minimizing any waste. And the community center, very similar to some of the other projects I've show, showed you, consists of a prefabricated timber panel system which rests on a reinforced concrete basement level. Um, spruce was used for all structural elements, and then the exterior cladding is, is, is made out of um, silver fir, a, a very popular um, species in the region. So within, with, the, with the exception of the bathrooms, all walls and ceilings on the inside are also sheathed with um, solid sound silver fir boards. And the built-in furniture is actually made of solid wood as well. And the building is not a mass-produced structure, obviously, but is highly customized and carefully prefabricated by the village's sawmill and local carpenters. Um, it has a very compact uh, volume, airtight envelope assembly, triple glazing, timber wall panel, panel, panels with up to 12 inches of insulation, and a mechanical ventilation system which, with, heat recovery, with heat recovery, which make the community center a, a low-energy building. Um, again, a biomass-powered heating plant in the basements run, runs mostly in wood chips and supplies heating energy not only to this building but to seven additional, additional buildings in the, in the village. So in summary, looking at these, these projects and, uh, and many of the other projects in the region, the increasing industrialization um, of the construction process and the use of prefabrication techniques that are actually rooted in the craft tradition uh, minimize waste and help to optimize the use of energy and resources. The added values retained in the region by using local businesses and, and locally sourced building materials. And in associ association with uh, energy providers, the regional government has um, founded um, a, an organization which actively promotes reduced energy consumption, the use of energy, renewable energy resources, and environmentally friendly building products. And it also provides incentives and funding for private home homeowners and public investors based on a set of ecological guidelines. And, and through this, Foil Park actually possesses the highest numbers of low energy and passive energy houses in Austria today and is actually the, 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 the set the standard for all of Austria, which a lot of, a lot of these developments uh, coming out of Austria then set standards for, for other parts of Europe. So um, um, here's just a few more, few more interior shots of, of, of this building. 
uh, with its warm, untreated um, wood interiors. So um, in, in kind of summary, the province has been able to develop sustainable construction practices, but still retains its unique regional style and continues to serve as, as a role model for, for Austria and, and all of Europe. And many of the architects, actually local architects, now um, teach at universities in Germany, Switzerland, Liechtenstein, and, 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 and build in, in China and, 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 and all other parts of the world. And, and in my opinion, the, the region's unique and sensitive to approach to building provides convincing evidence of the architect's involvement um, in the problems and needs of the society in, in which they live. Obviously, one of the things that I mentioned earlier is, is, is the urban sprawl in the region, which is kind of the next challenge that, that they're trying to address. Um, but uh, again, they're kind of in the same boat with, 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 many, other, with, any, with many other cultures um, around the world. However, they kind of have this, this kind of strong tradition and, and, and and unique um, setup that they've already established for the architecture, which um, hopefully will allow them to come up with um, sustainable and, 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 and workable solutions for some of the, the, the pressing problems that they, that they face in the future. I've talked enough. Thank you for your time. I'm happy to take any questions if you have any. You mean whether the supply of the yeah, Austrian supply? Yeah, the forestry industry in these days. You mentioned it went through kind of a rough patch like a hundred years ago. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, it's obviously um, healthy enough to supp supply in the neighboring neighboring countries too. I mean, a lot of the a lot of uh, I mean, they produce glue limbs and, and, and prefabricated timber timber panels for export to obviously Switzerland and Germany and and, and France. And, I mean, I've even like I work for I mean. It's, Across the border, but I work with a Swiss firm, for example, and we, we did projects in England um, using those kind of systems. So um, they, they obviously have the capacity um, to to export. I mean, I, I guess it would just be a, a matter of demand in terms of the the, the stock, of, like the force, like the the stock of, of timber. Um, I mean, I can't. I'm not a forester. I can't speak to you know what you need to do in order to sustainably maintain these the forests that they have so I can't can't answer that question but in terms of the facilities that is definitely definitely there I mean they're they're relatively small family owned businesses but they they export they export worldwide I mean they're also I mean they're also built in you know in British Columbia and I don't know if they've done anything here in, in Oregon but um, they're involved in all across the world with timber construction some of those houses were around for Yes, the, I mean the shingle siding, the traditional shingle siding is obviously something that weathers over time and you know within 20, 20 to 30 years, depending on the exposure, the, the local, the, the microclimate, the site, and exposure of the facades. Obviously, those have to be replaced. But it's a, it's a very, um, a, the the type of wood that they use for it, the silver fir, is a wood that splits very easily with just a, with just an axe, and a lot of these. Houses are actually um, there. You can obviously make shingles with um, by sawing them, which you then cut through the fibers, which you make the wood more susceptible to, for uh, moisture and, and rot and so on. So the preferred technique is using the hand cutting technique, where actually with an axe, because an axe always wants to go parallel to the wood fibers, um, and these 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 types of shingles are more durable. And but they're the technique is actually very very easy. You could probably go. Albert and one of the carpenters could show you in 20 minutes how to how to make wood shingles out of a wood block. So it's a it's actually a very kind of low skill set that you need to 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 maintain those exterior skins of the of the vernacular houses. Obviously, I mean uh, even the contemporary examples. You know, all the siding the siding is not made to last 200 years, right? I mean, it's it's going to have to be replaced and in in due time. And that's you know that's just the way these, these buildings are designed. Along the same lines, you know, you have the, the historic architecture and a lot of overhangs and the steep roofs mm -hmm. to deal with the, the, mm -hmm. um, the climate. Mm -hmm. And then in the 60s, we saw this big shift mm -hmm. of starting to use the timber construction, but 
but no overhangs and flat mm -hmm. roofs. And, and I was just wondering how that held up and how it holds up today. Yeah, I know. I've, I mean, you know, I've, you know, I've obviously done extensive travel in the region, and I've also, and I've also talked to, to the architects, and um, and obviously, uh, a lot of the vernacular examples have endured so well because they have, they have these measures where they, the, the detailing is actually helping to maintain, helping to maintain the facades and the material. Um, a lot of the example, like the flat roof, is obviously very unsuitable for um, areas that get a lot of snow. A lot of the examples that um, that that I've shown you are actually in the Rhine River Valley. It doesn't get very heavy snowfalls. Um, I mean, there. Well, the the last example actually, the the community center is an is an is an is an is at a higher altitude, but it also doesn't have a flat roof as a result. So there is a response to there is a response to the to to kind of the the microclimate there. Um, in terms of the in terms of the in terms of the no overhangs. I think, you know, to some extent, I mean, a lot of it is obviously, um, a lot of it is obviously, um, there is obviously formal aspects that go into it. And um, if you if you were totally looking at, at making this a building that uh, is, is extremely durable, where the facades don't weather over time, um, you you might use different kinds of details. But um, then then again, there they're kind of basing basing a lot of their formal decisions also on the popular taste, as you will. So they're taking into account that they might not last as long. Um, you also have to keep in mind if you have a roof overhang, you get very uneven weathering. Like it was very it was you know it was very challenging in the beginning to get people to accept that your house is going to weather and you know when wood weathers it weathers when it weathers unevenly and if you have a completely exposed facade, eventually the whole facade will be more or less weathered evenly. If you have wood overhangs, you kind of get very, very strange patterns that can be very unsightly for kind of the average, the average person. So that's that's kind of another desire to to have these boxes weather weather very evenly. I don't know if that completely answers your questions. Uh, that aspect of the, the weathering is something that's common in, uh, for instance, Cape Cod and the states. You know, where you've been, the little cottages and such. Um, and that's also the uh, piece about uh, the, the craftspeople the going out into the forest and actually selecting their, their materials is, is, is very cool. Um, I'm wondering about the, the structural wall systems, and I, I know that that's, uh, and this is a, maybe a bit uh, beyond the boundaries of your, your talk, but maybe I'm just curious whether you know anything about it. I know that's uh, very common in Japan, these, these uh, prefab structural wall systems. And I'm, is there um, any comparison between how that's done or the unit that you're aware of um, in, in, the, in that uh, area and, and, and how it's done in Rothbard? You mean Japan compared? Uh, to the Japan? structural wall, you know, the prefab structural yes. wall systems. Um, yeah, I, I think it's it's a pretty common mm -hmm. technique, but I don't. I, I'm just curious if um, there are aspects of the, the systems that are used in this region and, and maybe that that are used there that you're aware of? I mean, I'm aware of, I mean, kind of the common way to fabricate these panels is actually just laminating them with glue, um, which you obviously then you deal with all the formaldehydes and, you know, organic, volatile organic compounds that come with that on the interior. So one of the latest developments is the one where you actually just use the hardwood dowels where you actually connect, connect um, the individual boards to each other without using any solvent, glues that might have solvents. I'm aware um, of that technique, and then I mean they're also they're also they're also starting to explore these. Um, and there's obviously an issue there's obviously an issue with timber construction in, in urban in urban areas, and that's why they were timber construction actually was also banned from urban areas in the middle in the Middle Ages because obviously one one house burns the whole city burns down. Um, but they're actually increasingly reintroducing these timber construction systems into cities. There's also one example in my book where they have done a low, a low income housing development in Indiana, actually, where they have, um, where they're using some of these solid, solid timber um, panel construction system because they obviously have, have, uh, have better fire ratings than just regular timber frame, timber frame systems. Just and the density of the wood that prevents. Yeah, it's just that you know the burn off factor is going to be you know the like this. Surface to volume ratio is obviously um, a lot better than if you build a stick frame house, right? And um, but.
but they're still they're still they're still struggling with a lot of the local building building regulations that you can only in, a, in certain in certain areas you can only build a certain number of stories um, with with timber frame panels. I mean, there's there's a, there's one building in Berlin that just went up recently several years ago. I, I don't remember how tall that is, but there there's just there's a project in London that was recently completed where they actually made a timber timber frame a, a building with these timber frame panels that's nine stories tall, which is unprecedented. I think it's the tallest timber frame multifamily building in an urban urban setting. So. I, I mean, they're constantly, you know, pushing the envelope. Like, none of none of these. While there are some manufacturers that have standard products that you can more or less buy off the shelves, a lot of them are customized according to the specific project. And then a lot of the detailing, with in terms of fire protection and so on, has to do with the individual project. And then obviously also with the individual building, with the building regulations of the specific uh, location. I'm not I'm not very familiar with any of the Japanese building techniques. I mean, that's that is right. It's, it's sold by Berkhoiser. It retails for $89, which is a little ridiculous. But if you go onto Amazon, you can get it for $60. Bucks. <laughs> <laughs>